Good morning, everyone. Um, and as Mike says, welcome to our Gatekeeper Annual Conference uh, on the theme today of Art Rescues the Heart. And Peter Dawkins will be speaking a lot more about that theme. Um, but a very warm welcome to you, wherever you're joining us from over the country and perhaps further afield, I hope so. Um, many of you will, of course, be very familiar with Gatekeeper Trust, but for those who aren't, um, to say a few brief words, the Trust is coming up to its um, 40th anniversary next year and is dedicated to connecting with and honouring the land um, we live in, and particularly the energies in the landscape and the spirit of place, wherever we live, wherever we are. To this end, Gatekeeper promotes pilgrimage to places which may um, be long revered, ancient or sacred sites, or places where nature or the spirit of the land itself speaks to our soul. And of course, this can be in cities as well as, as some of our speakers will know that reference. And a key date gatekeeper discipline is always to ask permission to enter sacred sites. So I wish you a very enjoyable day. Um, uh, heartfelt wishes for all of us to enjoy this and to dedicate um, our coming together. Um, I will just light a gatekeeper candle. And here we have it. And I'll, hopefully the matches will work. So I'd like to dedicate this day to the spirit of the land, wherever we are across the world and in the British Isles to co-create a heart-filled network um, and maybe further afield for this day and, and hope for um, the overlighting spirits and angels to shine their wisdom upon us. And this candle will be burning all day to accompany us. Accompany us. I'll just put it up here. Where well, hopefully I won't block it up. And you can see it. Um, so I would love to, I'm very happy to introduce Peter Dawkins um, for our first talk to introduce the theme of the day. This is a theme which is very close to his heart and um, we're very lucky to have him here with us, especially as it's his birthday today. So from all of us, I'd like to wish Peter a very happy birthday and I'm sure you'll join me in that. Um, so Peter is a philosopher, most of you know this, uh, an author, a teacher, visionary, and a geomancer, and a principal founder of the Gatekeeper Trust. Um, and he's going to set the theme of the day and tell us how heart does indeed, sorry, so art, art does indeed rescue the heart. Over to Peter Dawkins. Oh, thank, thank you very much, Stephen. And um, yeah, it is my birthday, I can't quite believe it is, but... <laughs> But the theme, Art Rescues the Heart, is very much, very much close to my heart. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about, Art Rescues the Heart. And the whole conference will be about this and different kinds of art and so on. But I'd like to add to the name Art Rescues the Heart that um, it's the right kind of art that rescues the heart, because we're not all the same. So it is an art in itself to create or discover the right sort of art for the right person. And nature is a wonderful example of this, for it is full of all sorts of works of art and is ever changing. Well, the Gatekeeper Trust was actually formed by a group of people, including myself, who had a deep love of nature and of the arts. And we love the beauty of nature in all its various forms. Moreover, we were all artists in various ways, with artistic talents that included poetry, music, song, dance, painting, sculpting, as well as philosophy, seership, and storytelling. And we all loved walking in nature. 
and performing where and when required, when inspired to do so by nature or by the spiritual world underlying and overlighting nature. We tuned into nature and we could feel and see when nature responded with delight when we did things just right. And we could see that we could inspire and delight nature in return, just as nature inspired and delighted us. It was a kind of lovemaking. When we founded Gatekeeper Trust as an educational charity, we had all this in mind. Hence the objects of the trust are very broad and include research into the nature and structure of all forms of art, particularly sacred art, including drama, ritual, music, dancing, and folklore. And to research these things means that one has to do these things, as well as observing and learning from others doing them. Well, art rescues the heart is very much a Dionysian theme. In the myth of Dionysus, which is equivalent to that of Europa and the bull from which Europe derives its name, the goddess Pallas Athena rescues the heart of Zagreus, the soul, and raises it until Zagreus becomes Dionysus, son of God, wherein sun means the sun, S-U-N, the light of the world, light of the universe and God means love. Moreover, light means delight, happiness, joy, which makes us shine. It is a state of illumination, an exalted state of love, and is the result of lovemaking or love in action. Now, Pallas Athena is the 10th muse and goddess of the arts and sciences. In other words, she's the muse of muses who inspires all artists and philosophers and ultimately brings about illumination or knowledge concerning what is done and how to do it well and the laws that underlie it all, because we have to learn the laws. It is the arts that rescue and raise the heart, the pure heart, the good heart, the heart that is loving, intelligent and wise. To rescue the heart means to rescue love, to unlock and re release love with its wise, intelligent consciousness and innate power, and then to raise and increase it to as great an extent as possible. This is our true soul, and to raise it produces enlightenment, which is a joy, a delight, and a knowledge of truth. But to rescue and raise the heart requires artistry and skill. Now the artist is someone who does everything well with artistry, with wisdom, understanding and skill, both practical and aesthetic. And the artist has to learn how to do this, which is the science, and then to do it in such a way that the result is beautiful, inspiring, and produces happiness, joy, delight. And delight is the meaning of light, and such light is beautiful. As the English poet John Keats wrote in his ode on the Grecian urn, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. Then as Shakespeare pointed out in his play, As You Like It, we're all actors on the stage of the world. And to quote him, all the world's the stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. Well, this land or landscape is our stage. And actors, good actors are artists. And that's what we're all trying to be. Well, I hope we're trying to be. <laughs> Walking the land artistically requires knowledge, which is a science, and skill, which is an art, in order to produce delight. Delight given by the artist to others, but also delighting the artist, a delight shared with other people and with nature. And the essence of this really is love. It is lovemaking. 
So an actor is an artist who knows what character he or she is playing, is in tune with that archetype and the greater whole, listens carefully, inwardly as well as outwardly, knows the lines of the play or is inspired with them, dresses and behaves accordingly, is fully aware of and in tune with the other actors, the audience, the stage and the theatre, moves in harmony with the other actors, makes the necessary connections with the audience, makes the necessary connections with the theatre and with nature above, below and all around, and knows where to be on the stage at any time for the best results in terms of the whole company and the play. And the good actor moves artistically, like a dancer, with appropriate gestures, heartfelt and heart-driven. The good actor speaks well, sings well, and appears with the other actors as a moving work of art. And this is poetry in motion, a musical, a painting to behold, a kinetic sculpture. And such an artistic acting inspires the other actors and the audience. It can be felt, heard, seen and experienced and creates joy or delight. I've always used and, and share with others useful axioms, which I find are good to remember. That it, they are to do the right thing in the right place at the right time and with the right orientation. And also to love whatever you're doing, wherever you are, whoever you're with, all of the time. Well, if we can do all that perfectly, we'd be doing pretty well. <laughs> And then we need a knowledge of time and place. Uh, that, that's chakras in time and chakras in space. That's key to that. We also need a knowledge of how to breathe well, combining the spiritual breath, which inspires the heart, with the natural or physical breath, which fills the lungs and travels the body via the bloodstream. Knowledge of the life process is required and how energy, spiritual and natural, moves through the body and through the land. We need to learn how to work in harmony with it, enhancing the flows. We need knowledge of the continuous birth, growth and death cycles, which are designed to magnify and improve all life and bring all to perfection of beauty and knowledge of truth, the truth which is a light, as I said before, a delight, a joy. And joy seems to me to be the aim of all life, and art is the means by which it is achieved. So our task is to become artists, good artists, in all the ways we can, or are called to do, or inspired to do, so as to create and spread delight. And fundamentally, this is all about love, loving love, and loving each other, loving nature, loving all life, loving the universal and loving the individual. And that love or the love is an energy because everything is essentially energy and the form that it takes in the universe. Energy is movement, e motion, and all movement vibrates. And energy at its best is love energy and it is this which produces light or delight as is said to have occurred on the first day of creation and to produce delight such as this is an art which is essentially a love making but it takes two to make love all this is told in the myth of pan and echo Pan is the spirit of the universe. Echo is nature, Pan's beloved. Pan is the spirit, Echo is the soul. 
Pan is the creative vibration of the universe, the vibrating energy that creates and drives all things. It is the breath of life. An echo receives the breath and echoes it, giving it a form of expression. And this is equated with sound and music and is symbolized by the pan pipe. Pan is the musician, echo is the pan pipe. Pan breathes into the pipe, echo gives this breath the sound and musical form. Pan inspires echo with wisdom. Echo sounds it, paints it, sculpts it, and builds it into multitudinous forms of harmony and beauty. And this harmony and beauty is that of nature when her echoing is truly artistic and inspired. Well, I'd now like to share with you some of the inspiring and beautiful places and works of art in nature that we have experienced and enjoyed, which I personally love and which have a deep meaning to me. So I'm going to share my screen now and some slides. So first is of Land's End in Cornwall, which is the root chakra of the three lands of the British Isles. It's something that my ancestors come from and always inspires me when I go down there to the Land's End area. I used to paint all this. And then now and again, you come across these wonderful sculptures that some Celtic artist has done. This is a Celtic cross in the landscape, just hidden away. And then also hidden away, these lovely pools, rock pools and so on, surrounded by all the vegetation of nature. And then the coastline, that's Cape Cornwall. And I love the rocks and the sea crashing against them and Everything like that's pure art in motion. And then another place that really inspires me is Iona. And that's, that's looking at Iona. That's a bit closer. There's the Abbey, and that's Dunny in the background. That's the highest point on Iona. I get very inspired when I'm there. And then that's um, St. Columba's Bay, where Columba landed with his companions. And this is a wonderful valley called Valley of the Temple, which is very inspiring. I have had, gave me many visions and so on there. I painted it many times. And um, that's, that's uh, Dunny again with some pilgrims going up there. And that, it's full of rainbows especially when we go there, they appear just at the precise moment they need to appear just to confirm we've done things right. And the wonderful rising suns, that's rising sun over Mull, seen from Iona. And Scotland generally is so inspiring to me, especially further north in Scotland in the Ascent area. So this is actually sunset um, right up in the Ascent area, which is the crown chapter of the Grail Land. Here's some of the great mountains. And the locks as well. They ride, the mountains rise like giant creatures, I always think, guarding the land. It's up there, one can feel one goes right out of the universe. And this is walking towards the most northerly beach on the western coast called Sandwood Bay. And um, it's a mile long beach. And that's 
five, about five miles south of Cape Roth. That's the sea, famous sea stack. And that's looking towards Cape Roth. I find all this pure poetry in motion. As the coastline is wild, but also gentle. It has the most wonderful pools and streams, and rocks and bracken. Wonderful colors. Nature's a wonderful artist. Then you get all these rivers. Has a lot of water in Scotland, which is great, great for it. <laughs> Lucky country. Exciting rivers. They need to crash around as they flow, I think. And this is coming down into the River Tay, beginning of the River Tay, Scotland's sacred river. And it's flowing right down further uh, to a place called Dunkeld, which was um, uh, monks from Iona set up a monastery there. It has the most beautiful walks along the river through these trees. So this is autumn time. I've, I've taken these photographs. But aren't the colors beautiful? I mean, for a painter like I used to be and a poet like I used to be, this, this is such a delight I find, it's so inspiring. And then this is Scotland's sacred mountain, She Hallian. And um, some people call it Mount Zion. And it's seen across this wonderful loch called Loch Rannoch. And then the Lake District is special to me. And this is the, what I call the Heart Lake. It's actually called Grasmere, but I call it the Heart Lake in the real center of the Lake District. And then I want to take you to landscaping that's been done by human beings. This is Rousham Park landscape designed by William Kent, the landscape architect. And there's the wonderful sighting he set up across the, there's a river down below there. and then. You see across the other side. And then in the walled gardens, you find this wonderful dovecote and the garden shaped around it with all the roses and so on. And this is an example of a lovely pool there with its fountain. So the gardeners are artists. The gardeners have done all this planting using nature to bring out the best. And this is Kew Gardens. I also get excited by Kew Gardens in London. Again, here you've got the example of gardeners being the artists here. Designed this wonderful display of colour. It enhances everything, gives, gives thousands of people delight. And then you get the more man-made works of art, as it were, coming up like this, planted carefully there. And then we come to Bonington, the special place just outside Edinburgh in the north. It's called Jupiter Artland, the park surrounding Bonington House and the lovely gateways. I just thought I'd show you the gate because we're gatekeepers. And then this is um, called, a great sculpture called Cells of Life, done by Charles Jenks. Which to enter Jupiter Artland, you go through this huge landscape sculpture. Sculpture. In Bonington House, the Jacobean House, and it has this amazing, wonderful sundial from that era in a very special place in the garden. And inside, this is a ballroom. It's, it's a modern 
work. It's a wing that's been added to the house by our friends there. And decorative plaster work is amazing by Naomi Johnson, and Bob Moore. And then in the garden, in the, in the park itself, there's this lovely sculpture, many sculptures in fact, but this lovely sculpture by Ian Hamilton Finley called the Tenth Muse. Tenth Muse calls it Pallas Athena. And then finally, this dream sculpture, which is put up at Sutton at St. Helens in Merseyside, 66 feet tall by Joan Plenser. It's on the site of, the, of a cat colliery. And that dream sculpture is of a girl in meditation dreaming a better future. And it's actually on the AA point of the landscape Zodiac of Britain, the cusp of Gemini Taurus. Quite extraordinary, it's only just put up a few years ago. So it's the marker for the beginning of the new great age, new beginnings, because that's where the midsummer sun position is right at the moment. So it shows you artists and others can get thoroughly inspired to do the right thing in the right place without even knowing why. <laughs> Great hopes for, for the future and evermore. Um, so I think that brings me to the end of what I want to say and share with you. I hope that was all right. Peter, thank you. That was really wonderful. Um, so inspiring and you know there's a real sense that we we need or the heart needs rescuing at the moment um and it's so lovely to be reminded that art has such a fundamental place in in making that rescue and i love the idea that uh, we're all actors in the theater of the world on the stage of the landscape it's very beautiful so thank you so much for that thank you Stephen.